Well, welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a good lunch. Uh, I was uh, actually adventurous enough to try the uh, AT&T cake pop, pop. It was pretty good. It turned my lips a bit blue, but it was good. Um, so thanks a lot to AT&T for uh, their support. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Faris Yakob is the Chief Innovation Officer at KBS and a founding partner of Spies and Assassins, the mysterious creative technology boutique. Um, he's received awards for strategic and creative excellence and helped to create and share the new category at the London International Awards to drive innovation in advertising solutions. Uh, in short, he's trying to make everything more awesome at the intersection of technology, business, behavior, and culture. So if you'd join me in welcoming Faris to the stage, our next speaker. Hello. This is called The Importance of Being Awesome. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. How are we all doing? Good. Are you having a nice day so far? Yeah. Did you enjoy the lunch? Yeah. Are you feeling a bit sleepy? Yeah. I thought you might be. All right. I don't have long, so I can't really have any more small talk and banter. Um, uh, I'm going to go through three provocations relatively rapidly. The first concerns the nature of what technology is and culturally understood to be. The second is how that understanding impacts the nature of what media might be. And the third, at the confluence of those two uh, provocations, comes the nature of what awesomeness is and why it's so very, very important. If, oh, this is me. You may recognize me from standing here, where I almost was standing. If you wanted to make this experience slightly more participatory, as potentially befits the nature of the media skate you currently operate within. And instead of just talking about me over the back channel while I'm speaking, you could speak to me. You could use this handy designation known as a Twitter handle, where you can at questions at me, and I can respond to them later via a sort of time-shifted digital means. You don't have to, obviously. The onus is very much on me to help talk, and you can just sort of sit there. Hence the audience nature of your audience sort of positioning. Um, uh, this picture is just here to remind you um, that I don't have any answers, I just have provocations and antlers. See? Answers, antlers. Honestly, come on, you can laugh more than that. <laughs> there you go! It's going to be more fun if you get involved, honestly. Right, so technology first, right? Um, I wanted to think about what technology was, because we're talking a lot about technology and how it impacts media today, and so I wanted to think about what it was we were talking about, so I made this little thing. But it needs the audio to be on. I made that thing for a couple of reasons. One, I was informed that I was doing the post-lunch, what we call the graveyard slot, in, in, uh, in conference terms. And so I thought you might want to be woken up a little bit. I really like Jungle, which is that form of music from the mid to late 90s. Um, and I try and use it whenever I can, sort of spread that dead gospel. And um, I really like annoyingly complex keynote transitions. I find people are oddly impressed by them. And green and pink is good too. But more importantly than all that, at least kind of for this point of view, is um, a technology is that. That's what technology is in your heads, I think. I was trying to extract what I thought your brains would do when I said the word technology. Because it is like that, right? It's sort of robots and satellites and circuit boards and kind of things that feel a bit aggressive and, and essentially other. In fact, fundamentally other. And that's kind of the problem because um, um, media has historically had this massive liberal arts bias, right? And now technology is really important to media, and we're frightened of it. Um, I should probably hurry up. 
OK, good. See, because technology is all that stuff. It's true, but it's also this. Because writing is a technology. It's a fundamental technology, a crucial technology. It's the only technology that is utterly pervasive and ubiquitous in our culture. It's the only one that we use inside the operation of our own minds to assist thought, which is a staggering idea to me, anyway. Um, but media, you see, is technology. Um, but no one thinks of it that way anymore. Um, TV is obviously technology, but no one thinks of it as technology because it's just stuff. Because it's always been around since we were kids, and so it's just stuff, right? So no one thinks of it as technology. This is because of what technology is now, what it culturally has come to represent and mean for us. Um, are you familiar with Walt Disney's Imagineering Department? Yes, some of you? Okay. It's really awesome. It's um, Disney's R&D group, essentially, where geniuses like Danny Hillis, who's one of the fathers of modern computing, sort of retire to, to invent rides and such, um, I imagine. But, um, uh, uh, and so uh, Bran Ferrin was once the president and head engineer R&D guy at the Imagineering Lab. He's currently the special advisor to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. His opinions are incredibly important to this country. He said technology is stuff that doesn't work yet. That's what we mean when we say technology to people. We mean things that have come into existence so recently that A, they're in beta, and B, if that makes sense, and B, we don't understand culturally how they're used as yet. So it's not clear, right? And so it becomes confusing and other. That's technology. Technology, media is technology, that's that bit. Now, technology also impacts media. This is a good slide. It's slightly complicated though and slightly lower resolution, so let me explain. Over here, number of available media channels and time on the bottom, right? X axis time. 1700 all the way to the present day ish. Okay? As you can see, to begin with, there wasn't a lot of media and it didn't change very rapidly. It kind of grew at a normal rate. And then at a certain point here, things go like this. Phew! I'll demonstrate that with this red line. Watch. Phew! Now, the point about phew is that that's the exact point when Moore's Law became the driving uh, force in media. Before that, not. At that point, Moore's law, which those of you who are geeky will be familiar with, is the law that the amount of chips you can squeeze onto a transistor doubles every 18 months as the cost halves. This means that computers get twice as fast and half as cheap every year and a half. It has an exponential growth. It has a tendency to exponentiate, is the word apparently, which is a great word, I think. Um, the point of that is that it changed things faster than we understand. No other technologies that exist in human history change like this. Cars do not get twice as fast and half as expensive every 18 months. Neither do fridges, neither does anything else. Only computers do. And because media is now a function of computers, it changes a lot of stuff. This is basically a measurement of bandwidth, number of channels in which you can put stuff, right? At the very top of the curve, it's starting to go straight up. Those of you who are familiar with maths and graphs and curves will get that that means things are about to approach infinity. In fact, my position on this is that we already have touched infinity. There is an infinite amount of media space, because bandwidth and storage are functionally free. The marginal cost of computing and storage is zero. So media is infinite, and as Shirky points out, abundance breaks more things than scarcity. Scarcity is how you make economic business models, abundance is how you break them. So there's more stuff, right? More bandwidth, more space. Secondly, Going pretty well, it's good. There is a correlation between the amount of time it takes to distribute something and the amount of time it takes for that thing to have an effect. You with me? No. OK, so by definition, there's a correlation between the amount of time it takes information to transmit itself through culture and the amount of time it takes culture to change in response to that information. Information is what changes things. Let me explain. A long time ago, this was the speed of information. Well, not this, but me running faster. And in like a loincloth, probably. Because um, in ancient Greece, when the dude ran the marathon, it wasn't for charity. It was because, um, it was because somebody had won a war, and someone else needed to know about the war being won 26.3 miles away. And the only way to get the information that far was to have a guy run. And then, later, hundreds of years later, it turns out, somebody looked at a horse and went, what if 
Brilliant. So the information rate got a lot faster, right? A lot faster. And that keeps happening. Information flows more efficiently through the system than it ever has. Email travels at near the speed of light, as electrons through copper wires, mostly. But it's still point to point. No one overhears emails, so the information cascade effect is diminished, right? Have to know someone to email them, at least, kind of. And then you get Twitter. And Twitter is fundamentally different. Twitter is a micro-broadcast network, and so we have a world in which we have at least a billion people with camera phones connected to broadish, bandish mobile internet services, and the ability to make things public immediately, and the social primacy, the drive to get there before other people, which means the latency in the system is almost approaching zero. And the corresponding cultural decay rates are equally speeding up. Things that are interesting this morning on Twitter are boring this afternoon on Twitter. Ideas burn out and die super fast. So the latency of culture is a hugely important determinant of how ideas are received. <sighs> OK, I have to speed this up a little bit in relation to that. So the two ways to understand how the mediascape has been distorted by technology making bandwidth and storage cheaper is more faster. There is going to be more media, and it's going to move faster through the system. OK. So, why does the future then belong to the most awesome? Because we are in a stage of transition where human interpersonal networks are going to substitute or supplement commercial broadcast networks. And, therefore, the things that are most shared, the things that are most spreadable, are the things that, I guess, win in content terms. Because, in media terms, Media that wins functions like a solidarity good, which is an economic class of goods that becomes more valuable the more it is consumed. It's counterintuitive, it's like a Giffen good, if you like, because most products, the more you consume them, the less there is of them. With media products, the more you consume them, the larger the audience, the more they're valuable they are. Oh, so the more shared something is, the more valuable it becomes in culturally terms. This piece of research from the New York Times basically demonstrates the fact that awesomeness is the single biggest driver of sharing, of spreadability. Awesomeness, however, in a specific term, I mean, a definition of awesomeness. Awesomeness used to mean terrible. Did you know that? Did you know that? Anyone? <laughs> Good. Right. So, it used to mean terrible because they're both terms used to understand the presence of God. Things that are awesome and terrible create awe and terror. It means the same thing. Specifically, then, awesome is the most shareable of emotions, because when you are a caveman or whatever, and you see the northern lights burning like a shining kind of green glowing blob in the sky, the first thing you have to do is run and find someone to show them. That's what awesome means, and that's the kind of content that spreads. So awesomeness is crucial, right? In fact, mo more and more crucial every day, thanks to things like Facebook and EdgeRank, because sharing stuff while you read it, the act of consumption itself becomes a broadcast signal to your network, the more awesome things are going to get more shared, get more eyeballs, make more money. Oh, Christ, we're really running out of time. This is exciting, isn't it? OK, um, so that's important. So Henry Jenkins is the professor of comparative media studies at USC's Anaheim School of Journalism. He was previously at MIT. He wrote a book called Convergence Culture, which is quite important. His new book is called Spreadable Media, or Spreadability, because, based on this kind of thinking, if the content doesn't spread, it dies. Just buying reach is no longer sufficient. Not only that, it gets a bit more complicated, <laughs> obviously, because, and here's my third provocation, content is no longer sufficient. This is going to be hard for a media audience, isn't it? <laughs> OK, um, the thing about this is, right, um, um, previously, up until super, super recently, the production and publishing of stuff, the ability to make things public, was a privileged act, specifically legally privileged. Governments could do it. The media industrial complex could do it. And ad agencies could do it. And no one else could do it, really, at least not to scale. There were fanzines and stuff, but that doesn't really count. Now, everyone can do it. And they're doing it all the time. Much faster than we can do it, actually, usually. The problem with this, or the opportunity, depending on how you think about it, um, is that the difference between not being able to do something and being able to do something is infinite. The difference between being able to do something really, really badly and do something really, really well is a matter of degree. 
since a kid growing up now has access to iMovie as soon as they start breathing, probably, I imagine, my first Mac or something, um, making films just isn't that impressive, basically, <laughs> as an idea. Previously, it was by its nature awesome because no one else could do it. Now it's not. So my supposition is we need to supplement some of our skills in media with some new ones because whilst media are all technologies, technology is also a medium. With me? Yeah, you are. Technology is a medium. It can be used to express things just like we use words and pictures. Here's an example very quickly. The WWF ah. is one of the most important environmental organizations in the world. For 50 years, the WWF has pursued one goal, to rescue the rainforests. How can we turn this goal into a global mission? Millions of square meters of rainforest are cleared every year, just for paper. Paper on which pointless documents are printed out all over the world. We wanted to put an end to this unnecessary printing and start raising global awareness of the destruction it causes. That's why we invented the world's first green file format, the WWF. A file format that simply cannot be printed out. Our simple message, save as WWF, save a tree. A WWF document. Do it's really smart, isn't it? It's a really smart way to solve a problem, and it's not a way that involves words or pictures. It involves file formats, code. So my point is, the subtitle of this talk, if you'll remember, I think we have to supplement. It's not really from art and copy to. I think these binary dialectics are from and to, thinking, making, doing, but are very childish and naive, frankly. Um, but we still need art and copy. It's still really great. However, we need to supplement art and copy with Arduinos and code, Arduinos being an open sourced hardware hacking circuit board you can use to make things physical, digital things, and code being a fundamental creative deliverable of our agencies and industry. To the point where you have creative directors trained with words and pictures looking at algorithms going, I don't know what it says. How am I supposed to creatively review this? Good question. We have to fix that, right? Almost done. I ran out of time already. But so uh, one of the things I tried to do to try and fix that is inside the ad agency KBS where I work, we set up a company. I helped co-found with my two partners, a company called Spies and Assassins, that is a creative technology shop. It employs developers and hardware engineers and multidisciplinary kind of ITP-like geeks, if you're familiar with ITP program, which is very good. And so we make things to sort of try and be awesome, um, like this kind of iPad personalization kiosk thing we did for Puma. And like, you know, we built the code, and we built the little framey thing that goes on the thing, and the stand it goes on. We think about the hardware and how it connects to the software and the complete user experience and all that. And we built this little array of 32 iPads connected to a central server, so we had to write the software for the server and work it had to get a power supply strip that supplies all those different iPads at the same time without overheating. <gasps> I'm really almost done, I promise. Um, and then like, screw it in place and install it in a Beijing store and a Paris store and now in 15 more stores around the world. Um, and you can play games on it and stuff. And soon they'll be interconnected so you can play games against the people in Beijing if you're in Paris, which is going to be super rad. Um, and we did this thing, like a peep show thing, which is really silly and really great at the same time in the changing rooms. Um, it's a little box and you open it and it plays little loops of crazy, creepy video. <laughs> and we had to work out how the catches work on the doors because if they don't close again, the surprise is ruined when you go in, so it's got to be spring-loaded. This stuff is just like <laughs> different to think about for us. So anyway, that's kind of what I uh, thought would be good. Um, so my point is, uh, this stuff is really scary to everybody, I think, right? Because tech people don't get media people, and media people don't get tech people, even though, as I said, technology is a medium, and media are technologies. Um, so uh, don't worry. <laughs> it's going to be fine. In fact, it, it's going to be um, better than amazing. It has to be awesome, basically. Thanks. <laughs>